Good morning, USA. Yo, 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 Angela Yee already told you the Breakfast Club, as you know it, is officially over, bro. She's taking this leaving thing serious, huh? What the hell is wrong with you? What do you what, what part of leaving don't you understand? I, I, I just Jesus I, Christ, I she got her own the, show. I thought they said okay. the fall. This, <laughs> this is the second day in a row that I said Angela Yee, and I didn't hear nothing back. Well, it's feeling like fall a little bit, okay? But, you know, way up when Angela Yee starts this fall, or... Whenever Angela wanted to, maybe it started already. She was, <laughs> we just didn't know. Nobody gave us the memo. Responded two days in a row. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You are absolutely right. How well, was your night though? Mine was was pretty good. You know, uh, of course, my car show is this Saturday, so now it's the preparation where all these celebrity cars that I have, I actually have to go get their vehicles and drive their cars because I don't want nobody taking their cars. I mean, they're allowing me to have their you know expensive cars, and I don't want nobody to crash. I don't want nobody to do anything bad. So. I'm driving around picking up Meek Mill's cars, Meek Mill's motorcycles, uh, picking up Fabulous's cars, picking up uh, Fat Joe's cars, Little Kim's cars, and everybody's cars. So I had to actually, you know, pick them up, take them to the trailer, load them up, get them down to Atlantic City, and all that. It's going to be a great, a great event. I see Lynn and, and uh, Trader True for all already on the road. They they got about 30 cars they're bringing from Houston. So if you see them brothers on the road. Uh, you pass by them on 95, blow them, blow them a horn, say what's up to them. And, uh, you just say blow them? A horn, blow Jesus the horn. Jesus Christ, I know that's a long ride, and you probably want them to come here and relax, but damn, maybe. I said blow the horn. Blow the horn. Oh. And definitely, you know, pray for them. It's a long drive. It's about a 19-hour drive. So the, the, both of those brothers are in the cars with their, uh, their vehicles. So just, you know, pray for them. Make sure that they get here safe. You know it's competition, but... We love those brothers and want to make sure those brothers get here safely. So shout out to Trader Joe's. I wouldn't want that kind of responsibility. Well, I got to watch over all them people cause. Oh, yeah. No. That's what you got to do. I mean, we have insurance and all that. That's what you got to do if you're doing a car so. Yeah. I mean, you have insurance and all that. And you don't, you want to put on a great show for the people because it is a family fun day. We, You know, we want people to bring their kids and their, their, their mothers, their fathers, their grandparents. It's You know, it's a big family fun day where, you, you know, people can just, you know, enjoy life and in a safe environment. So, you know, we encourage everybody to bring the family. Like the guy I called yesterday said his uh, father was 92 and they were coming. And that's what we want. Like I said, my dad will be there. He's he's 80 this year. My, my small kids will be there. It's it's a family fun day. I'm super duper excited for it. What about you? you preparing for the show tomorrow? Well, today, I should say. Man. Uh, yeah. Tonight, you can watch uh, my late night talk show, Hell of a Week, 1130, right after, com- right after uh, the Daily Show on Comedy Central. So I've definitely been preparing for that. But I'm just tired, bro. I'm, I, I can't do things that I used to do. Okay, if I do certain things at a certain time, it throws me all the way off. But you had sex you know, last we, night or something? We be doing these. I'm, yes, I did actually. See? But we've been doing these intense workouts. <laughs> so we do these. We do these. Uh, you know, we do hit training during the week. Salute to my cousin Tone. What up, Tone? Uh, perm, perm, get you straight. So we do hit training during the week. But the thing about hit training, we did it. What's today? Thursday. We did something on Tuesday, and you be sore the next day. But boy, that next day. Is when it really hits you. Mm-hmm. And then you try to do, you know, a simple activity. Like walk up the stairs? Walk up the stairs, you know, and then do what married couples do. A little sexy poo. And then, you know, next thing you know, you done overslept an hour. Yeah, it happens. It's like that. So it let me, happens. Let me ask you one question before we start the show. 44 is no joke, bro. Before you uh you, you start up. your show, yeah. No, I'm not gonna say nothing. No. Oh. I just wanna know what like what do you listen to? What gets you hyped? Do you listen to gospel music? Do you listen to Hove? Like but right before you do your, your talk show, what what gets you in the mood? Nothing. I meditate yeah. and then we pray. And then, you know, Nyla Nyla is salute to DJ Nyla Simone, she's our DJ. But I I mean Nyla be playing stuff, but I don't I be I be in my zone. I be meditating, I be in my head. Okay. I be ready to go. I don't be thinking about the music. You don't be thinking about me. All right, well, let's get the show cracking. Joey about? Badass will be joining us this morning. We're going to kick it with Joey Badass. Joey Badass' new album, 2000, is really good. Like, phenomenal. I like it a lot. It's in my rap album of the year, uh, Consideration. It's that good. And some good rap came I mean, I, I, some good rap came out this year. I know some artists, I saw Tory Lane saying that, you know, he don't like a lot of the music that came out this year, but some good albums came out this year. Pusha T came out this year. Uh, Kendrick Lamar came out this year. Mm-hmm. There's somebody else I really like this year. Oh, that new Black Thought and Danger Mouse just came out. But Joy Badass, our future came out this year. But Badass, 
Joey Badass album is really dope. Really dope. So I can't wait to talk to him. All right. Yeah, you around? Oh, Lord. <laughs> she already told you, bro. I know. She told us over. You know, know. it's officially over. I Could know. you stop? All right. So LeBron James, he breaks NBA record. We'll tell you all about it. So don't move. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. V. Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. Let's get in some front page news. Yee, you there? All right. Well. Uh, WNBA scores is playoff time. New York beat uh, Chicago 98-91 and Vegas beat Phoenix 79-63. to All right. Now salute, also- to, uh, salute to the Las Vegas Aces, man. Drop on the clues bombs for Big Asia Wilson. 803 zone. Okay. You know I got me a Las Vegas Aces Asia Wilson jersey, by the way. And also congratulations to LeBron James. He just signed a two-year, $97 million extension, which includes a 15% trade kicker. Makes LeBron James the highest-earning player in NBA history with $532 million in guaranteed money. So, I mean, he's been around for, what, 19 years? 20 years? Mm-hmm. He's been playing at a high level for those 19, 20 years. So, you know, he's not one of those people that you're going to see signing for the veterans minimum as he as he is a veteran. Nope, he's mm-hmm. getting that guap. Yeah, Still. shout out to Clutch, Clutch Sports, uh, Rich Paul, and that whole team over there for getting that done. Now, a German man, goodness gracious, you talk about bad luck. Now, he has tested positive for monkeypox, syphilis, and HIV. That's 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 got to be like some type of historic award. It is, what, what would you call that if you was gambling? If you was a gambling man, that's, trifecta. that's everything, right? That's a trifecta. What do you what? call that? I'm not a, I'm not mm-hmm. a poker player. That's got to be something. What do you call it? Three that? of a kind? I don't, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. Now, it's so bad that his nose is actually rotting off. How? I don't know. But they had, there's, there's a picture of him, I believe, on Shade Room, and you can actually see his nose just kind of, like, disintegrating. At first, they Good. say doctors thought it was sunburn, and the man was sent home, and he said a few more days, he said his nose began to, to, began to turn black and, like, just almost as just right off. So he got syphilis, monkeypox, COVID, and what else? HIV. No, you ain't say that. I ain't hear you say that before. You yes, just I made did. That I now. said monkeypox, syphilis, and HIV. That's a straight flush, bro. So listen, did he get did he get diagnosed with all of them at one time? I didn't ask him. I don't know. Who that's, that's, just... that's what I would like to know. Like, did he get diagnosed with all of this stuff at one time? Like, he just go to the doctor for a random checkup, and they're like, hey, man, I got some news for you, bro. And hit him with all four? Goodness. Go three. Three. Monkey pox, syphilis, and HIV. I didn't add another one. I didn't say COVID. I thought you said monkey pox, syphilis, COVID, and HIV. I didn't say COVID. You just threw COVID in there. Nah, no, I, I didn't even say COVID early on now. I think, I'm not making I didn't say up. COVID? I think you did. Oh, I, oh, my bad. I didn't mean to throw COVID on him. He's diseases. He probably don't got nothing. <laughs> no, I didn't mean. I got a cold. <laughs> no, he don't have no cold. I, I didn't mean to throw COVID on him. But that Thank is God your. God bless that man, man. Where are you from? Germany. Yeah, keep him over there. Build a wall around him. <laughs> put him in masks. Put him in a hazmat suit. Don't let him leave where he is. Keep him right where he at. Keep him right where he at. Jeez. All right. Well, that is your front you page. All, how you got hit with that? I don't believe that. I got to see that to believe it. There's a picture on uh, Shadow. I'm going to send you the picture. Yeah, but I, that don't mean the story, right? That story sounds too wild to be real. You got hit with all four. Yeah. COVID, Three. syphilis, monkeypox, and HIV. Well, you said uh, H- four things first now. Uh, and there's only three. But he doesn't yeah. have COVID, right? She oh, Hollywood Unlocked. She said Hollywood Unlocked, but it's coming from the New York Post. Jesus Christ. All right. Well, get it off your chest. 800-585-1051. Maybe you're having a bad day, but your day can't be bad, as bad as that German man. So yeah, get it off your chest. Don't even call up here if you're that German man. We ain't got no good news for you. <laughs> no, nothing, nothing for but you. thoughts and prayers. Goodness gracious. 800-585-1051. Get it off your chest. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. Get it off your chest. Whether you're man or black. We want to hear from you on The Breakfast Club. So if you got something on your mind, let it out. Hello, who's this? Yeah, what's up, Envy? What's up, Trav? Hey, ye. Hey, Trav. Oh, she's not there. Oh, God. <laughs> what's up, sir? Peace, sis. What's happening? Listen, I, well, I heard a story yesterday I was going to talk about. I heard Orlando Brown out here saying that Diddy gave him the oo-wash Gouache, right? You didn't hear that? No. You mean that mouth? Uh, uh, like, but why do y'all? But uh, that doesn't Orlando Brown say that about everybody? Well, he definitely said. Listen, I believe a lot of things about Diddy. I definitely believe here first bottom, but I don't believe that he out here doing that to Orlando Brown. So Orlando Brown needs to stop lying on Diddy. Like he really needs to stop lying on Diddy. 
I mean, I think Orlando Brown says a lot of things for entertainment purposes. And, you know, oh, well, well, why well, not? I mean, entertainment. To be saying why? that a man did that to you. Yeah, I, I I agree with you, but you're, you're calling the radio station to talk about it, Trav. So, you you know, you watched so it. kind of worked because we didn't That's talk it. about it. I, I didn't hear I the mean, story. It was, I mean, I, I, hey, I saw it just like everybody else saw it. I didn't see and it. One, and there's one more thing, right? Prince was trying to bag hey, him and take mess. Oh, hey, girl. What's up, you hey, What's up, he sorry? Came, he just came out of nowhere. We talking about Prince trying to bag tank. Oh, okay. <laughs> Shut up, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what the gays do. The gays don't do too much talking. They, they, they just give you a little bit of a look, and then it's, they just expect you to bag them first. Like, we don't do too hey, much talking. We let me tell you something. I don't think there was nothing gay about Prince. I think Prince oh. was... Uh, if Prince used to be with some of the most beautiful women, bro. Listen, Char, most of the men I've talked to in my life have been with the most beautiful woman. Touche. I don't believe mm. you. Okay. I don't believe you, Trav. Well, them, uh, all right. them little dirty Delaware dudes you be messing with, they ain't been with first no beautiful all, women. Delaware, first, I ain't never dirty Delaware dudes you be don't, messing don't, with. Don't you be all through Jersey, Delaware. I heard about Jersey, you, Trav. Jersey and Tra- Philly, maybe, but not no Delaware. Tra- Bye, you be Tra- fishing Tra- in Delaware. I heard all about you, Trav. <laughs> Bye, Charlemagne. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Hello, who's this? Hey, what's up? What's up? This is Jody. Jody from um, South, South Carolina. Jody! What's up, What's happening? John Morant country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up with y'all? How y'all doing? Good, good. Get it off your Bless chest, Jody. Black and highly favored, bro. Man, listen. To be totally honest, I was so scared to even come on here just to say something, but I, I got to say this. What's up? Listen, I'm so, I'm so blessed. I know things don't be going like how it's supposed to be going for a lot of people this and the third, but yo, God don't give you too much that you can't handle and he don't do the bare minimum. So, yo, you just keep going, everything will be good. I'm sitting here at work in the parking lot right now. Okay. Damn. Okay. Thank you, brother. That's good, brother. I'm glad you're appreciating your situation, man. Hey, listen, I always had want to call and talk to y'all. Yo, I appreciate everything that y'all doing. Y'all keep it up. All right, brother. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Get it off your chest. 800-585-1051. If you need to vent, hit us up right now. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. Let's get to the rumors. Let's talk R. Kelly. Listen up. It's just in. All the guys. Guys. The rumor report. Guys. Guys. With Angela. Angela Yee. It's the rumor report. The Breakfast Club. Well, opening statements were yesterday in R. Kelly's federal trial on charges of child pornography and obstruction of justice. They are alleging that he had sex with minors on numerous occasions, recorded a lot of these assaults to VHS tape, and then also paid people who knew about the recordings to keep quiet when he did face criminal charges of child pornography in 2008. This was all said as jurors uh, started the federal trial yesterday. So prosecutors said during opening statements that R. Kelly had a dark side and kept a hidden world behind his fame and status. And the victims were as young as 14. Mm -mm -mm. And they said they were multiple girls hundreds of times. And so um, jurors are going to be shown video of R. Kelly allegedly having sex with a minor. There's one woman that they expect will testify. They said that in this footage, he repeatedly referred to his goddaughter's 14-year-old anatomy. And they're expected to see parts of three videotapes with R. Kelly having sexual contact with his then 14-year-old goddaughter, Jane, over the course of the trial. So they said he was a uh, Grammy-winning superstar who was also a serial predator who had sex hundreds of times with minors and went to extraordinary lengths to cover it up. So another videotape allegedly showing child porn won't be played because they said R. Kelly and his co-defendants, uh, Darrell McDavid and Milton Brown, allegedly covered it up, but witnesses will still testify about it. That's another thing, too. Like, you know, when, when they were saying uh, R. Kelly's team didn't want people to watch the Surviving R. Kelly doc, but what about the R. Kelly sex tape? That's been circulating for a couple decades now. Right. Well, the girl allegedly seen in multiple child pornography tapes from the late 90s having sex with R. Kelly is, they're saying, going to be the star witness and testify and say that he had sex with her when she was 14, recorded some of their hundreds of sexual encounters. And uh, those alleged encounters and those tapes were part of a 2008 Illinois child pornography trial in which R. Kelly was acquitted. If you guys recall when that happened after the witness uh, declined to take the stand. Now she's nearly 40 years old and she's finally expected to testify. Mm. You know, this is going to be, I mean, look, according to his attorney, she wants to know why 
Jane is coming forward now to testify that the tapes were of her. She said for the last 22 years, she has adamantly denied that it was her in that video before there was any criminal investigation. She denied it. She denied it repeatedly to prosecutors. She denied it to social workers, to police officers. She denied it under oath to a grand jury. I mean, listen, we know R. Kelly about to get sentenced crazy. He got got 30 years already, right? Mm Mm-hmm. In the other trial, right? Yep. He's already been sentenced to 30 years. Yeah, the precedence has been set. Right. All right. Now, Jonah Hill says that he will not promote any upcoming films so he can prioritize his mental health. He said he has spent nearly 20 years experiencing anxiety attacks, which are exacerbated by media appearances and public facing events. So he released that in an open letter. And so he has a a movie that he just finished directing his second film. It's called Stutz. And it's about him, his therapist and mental health. It's a documentary. So he said the whole purpose of making this film is to give therapy and the tools I've learned in therapy to a wide audience for private use through an entertaining film. Through this journey of self-discovery within the film, I have come to the understanding that I have spent nearly 20 years experiencing anxiety attacks. Travel the clues bonds for Jonah Hill, man. I love it. Whenever I hear stories like Jonah Hill or even Adrian Broner the other day, I don't care what people got to say about it. Because if you don't understand anxiety and panic attacks, then you just simply don't understand. So to see them be like, you know what? I ain't going. <laughs> mm-hmm. y'all, y'all, y'all been working with me for a long time. Y'all see, Charlotte, sometimes Charlamagne just don't show up. That's, and, and those be the reasons. And to be able to express that now in 2022 and not feel no shame for it, I love it. All right. And Meek Mill is issuing a $10 million challenge. And this is to music executives who said that his career was over. He tweeted out uh, and he said, if you are a corporate person that work in the music business and ever predicted Meek is over, I want to place a $10 million bet with you in contract. Label owners, a and R, CEOs, COOs, artists. I'm just finding out y'all was talking like that. Y'all said I was over at least five times, and I'm going to do it from independent side. No major vibes to make effortless. This is not a joke. This is for people that fake call the shots in this music industry. They really be washed and try to place their limits on you and want you to believe it's never. Well, I, I would need more information um, before I take a bet like that, though, because I want to know what what's considered what over. Me considered success. Yeah, yeah considered like, you know. Yeah, is it album sales? Is it the number of tickets you can sell on the road? Is it your merch sales? Like, what is considered success nowadays in the music industry? You can't, you can't really tell. Like, if you look at Meek's Dream and Nightmares, right? That wasn't a single, but it was a record that everybody loved, took off, and it's probably in the last... Cultural hit. Yeah, 15 years. It's the biggest record in the club to this day. So, you know Cultural what I mean? Cultural hit. Yeah, it's a hit. It's, it's not a hit on the charts, but it's, a, it's bigger than any record on the charts, in my opinion. You know? <laughs> And I mean, the industry is like sports, right? Like folks talk about artists like sports teams. If you had seasons that were better than the seasons you are having now, folks might say, well, he doesn't sell like he used to. So that's where the, the he fell off talk probably comes from. But I would just simply want to know what's considered success to Meek before, before, if I, before somebody takes that bet, you know? All right. Well, that is your rumor report. I do have a, a, a question, right? When mm-hmm. you talk about mm-hmm. anxiety, like we were talking about uh, Adrian Broner, right? And I get it. He he wasn't. We don't know why. He said his mental health wasn't right, so he canceled the fight. But, but now, what happens to everybody else involved in that? Is it just like f everybody else? Because you got people that paid for flights and were flying to come see him. You got promoters that put millions of dollars into this. You got you know. I'm, I'm sure they gave him a bag to to start training. Like so, how does that work when when you have it? I mean, because I, I get it. Yeah, if you if you don't feel comfortable or your mental is not right you can say i don't want to do it but how does that all play into everything else because you got people that you know spent their last to come see him fight and all that do they find somebody else to fight yeah, to take you know. his place uh yes they already did they, they have somebody fighting this weekend mm-hmm. uh figaro is fighting some, i forgot who stepped in to fight for fight for brona this weekend because if you're a brona yeah, the fight fan still goes on. you want to see brona though you know what i mean no disrespect yeah. to the other box you want to see brona you you paid your money to see brona or Jonah Hill, if he had something, you're paying to see Jonah Hill, not, you know, somebody else. It's just, how does that work? And I get it, but it's... Well, he's just talking about interviews, mm-hmm. Jonah Hill. He's not, you know... All right. Hey, man, I get all of that, but... Yeah, Ser- Sergi Lipinets is replacing Adrian Boner. Uh-huh. But I, I I don't think it matters, you know? I really don't. I think in, in moments like that, you have to be selfish because, you know, you push... When, when you push through, when, when, when you're dealing with, like, panic attacks and anxiety, it just makes it worse. And, and nobody has to deal with that 
except for the person that's dealing with it. So I, I, I would rather be selfish in moments like that. But Sorry. Do you, but do you show up for that person but I next do believe time? You, you know what yeah. I mean? And I do believe that you got to um, communicate that you're not doing something instead of just not showing up. No, yeah, but I mean, now it's easier to have those conversations no, I'm, I'm now than it was. Yeah, it's easier to have those conversations now than it was five years ago. Definitely 10 years ago. You know what I mean? You couldn't say that. Oh, man, I'm having a panic attack. I'm having an anxiety attack. People don't even understand what the hell you're talking about. No, you're right. But now, I think people understand a little bit more. But do you show up for them next time? You know what I mean? Like, it, it Depends how sp- I feel. <laughs> it might. All right. Well, front page news is next. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. Your mornings will never be the same. Leaving a child in a hot vehicle can lead to their death very quickly. If you see a child left unattended, call 911. If the child looks unresponsive, do what it takes to get him or her out safely. Paid for by NHTSA. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. Let's get some front page news. Where are we starting, Yeezy? Yee? All right. Well, when you want to find something online, how do you look for it? Google. Google. Yes, but do you know what Gen Z does? They said nearly 40% of Gen Z members, those are people born from 97 to 2012, uh, prefer to use TikTok for online searches. They don't have a long attention span. They've said that several times. They want to get information really quickly and get to the meat of it really quickly and not have to sort it out. So now instead of Google, they're going on TikTok to look for information. How do we feel about this? I'm confused. (laughs) <laughs> how so, do you feel like so if this? You search, how do you feel about this all heads so if you want to search let's say I don't know the White House you, you could search the White House and TikTok and then you see a TikTok video of the White House come up yep I feel like that ruins uh, how your brain processes information you know what I mean I, I, I feel like that messes with your ability to have it messes with your critical thinking skills that's what I think I don't think anybody's uh, doing any thinking actually because you're literally just letting people do all the, the the thinking for you. They're doing all the research for you. They, and you're just taking their word for it. How do you even know what they say is true? true. Mm-hmm. They also said that TikTok's use of video is very appealing to Gen Z users. They get a more comprehensive search result. What if the, what if what's in those videos is misinformation, though? Like, I, I just feel like it should be something else. Like, even when I Google, you know, when the Google cites me different sources, I'll go look at those sources, whether it's, you know, books, any type of documentation. Like, I just feel like just taking somebody's word for it in a video, that's not critical thinking at all. That's why I always say people wake up every day and they wait for social media to tell them what to feel about something. Now, according to this report, though, Gen Z does look for lighter topics on TikTok. So things like recipes, fashion tips, bar recommendations. But when it comes to heavier topics like COVID or election information, they'll go to Google for that. Okay. All right. I respect that. I, 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 okay. I respect that. If you go in there for the lighter <laughs> topics, cool. I get it. You know, mm-hmm. but for the heavier stuff, you got to do some research. Yeah, you got to do a little research. A lot of research, actually. All right. Now, a Florida court is saying a 16-year-old may be forced to have a baby even though she doesn't have parents and has told the court that she is not ready. So Florida may be forcing her to give birth after an appeals court ruled that she was not sufficiently mature enough to decide whether to terminate her pregnancy. So at the time, uh, you know, she was 10 weeks pregnant and she was blocked from having an abortion without the consent of a parent or guardian. But she, they said, had not established by clear and convincing evidence that she was sufficiently mature to decide whether to terminate her pregnancy. Having reviewed the record, they did affirm the child court's decision under that law. Man, what is going on in the world, bro? <laughs> like, that don't even sound real. Like, I understand the law, but there's no compassion or empathy whatsoever for this young girl. And right. how can you I mean, somebody, that's sad. Why, yeah, how can you say somebody's not mature? They're not mature enough to have an abortion, but you think they're mature enough to have a, a baby at 16? That makes no sense. Yeah, and so on her end, you know, she lives with a relative. She also has an appointed guardian. She also did enough research to gain an understanding about her <clears throat> medical options and their consequences. She's also pursuing a GED with involvement in a program designed to assist young women who have experienced trauma in their lives by providing providing educational support and counseling. Uh, she actually experienced renewed trauma, the death of a friend, shortly before she decided to seek termination of her pregnancy. And so now she has in her petition, which she completed by hand, 
uh, the teenager is sufficiently saying that she is mature enough to make that decision and she's not ready to have a baby. She doesn't have a job. She's still in school and the father is unable to assist her. How do you tell somebody, a teenager, that they're not mature enough to have an abortion, but they are mature enough to have a baby? This don't make no damn sense, man. Backwards. Is this real life? It makes no sense. <laughs> what? Oh, my All God. Right. And her guardian, by the way, we said she has an appointed guardian, is fine with what she wants to do. And her caseworker was with her in court as well. So don't know why I, I would think her wanting can't make this decision. I would think her wanting an abortion is because she realizes that, you know, she might not be mature enough to take care of this child right now. You know what I mean? Like, she's not in a financial position. She's not in no position to take care of a baby. I think she that's the reason for wanting to have the abortion. So to tell her she's not mature enough to have an abortion, but force her to have the baby is, even though she may not be mature enough to have the child, is wild to me. All right, well, that is your front page news. Very wild. All right. Now, uh, when we come back, Joey Badass will be joining us. We're going to kick it with Joey Badass. Brooklyn. So don't move. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. Rap album of the year category. It, it, it should be mentioned in, in that kind of conversation. That means a lot coming from you. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate that. Definitely worked really hard on that. I'm super satisfied with the project. I feel like all of the feedback has been really good. Every time I see you, I feel like you, you should have grew up in the whole and Nas era. Yeah. That's what I, even when I see you acting, I'm like, you are from that era. Like, your whole embodiment fits that era. That's why I, I told him this morning, I was like, yo, I said, it's very New York, but still fresh. When I came out at the time, man, it was like nobody had seen what I was doing, mm -hmm. you know? But for me, it was kind of like a natural reaction to what was going on, you know what I'm saying? Circa 2010, 2011, you know, a lot of stuff on the radio. It was like Young Money dominant. Then they started going West Coast with it, you know what I'm saying? And um, I just felt the need that New York needed something that, like, represented it again. And, yeah, now it's just kind of part of my DNA. Part you of hated my New York identity. radio at that time. I know that. Uh, well, you know, I was a kid. I hated everything. <laughs> <laughs> I hated literally everything. I didn't want to talk to nobody. I didn't want to see nobody. I had no type of gauge on really what was going on and to the magnitude of how it was going. Why, why did it take so long? Why Why 10 years between projects? Oh, no, nah, it wasn't 10 years between projects. It was five, five years. I thought 99, still, when, when 99 came out. Well, 99 was, was 10 years. 10 years. What was, was, was five years ago? All American. All American, bad. yeah, all American bad. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. But five years is a long time too yeah. in this business. Why five years? Man, it wasn't no specific reason. Like I it wasn't like I finished my last album. Like, yeah, I'm gonna take five years or mm -hmm. nah. It just it just happened that way, man. You know, I was experimenting, trying to find a new direction, trying to figure out which way I wanted to go. In addition, I had my first kid, you know, Congrats. my daughter, she's four years old now. Mm -hmm. Started doing a lot of TV and film stuff, started taking off, so it was just really getting used to a new balance. And then the pandemic set me back. Like I had a project, but then when the pandemic started, I got connected with myself in a different way, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it became a whole different thing, you know? So it was just, it's kind of the way it lined up. But I'll tell you this, like I ain't never planning on going away for that long again. I was gonna ask you, how did you get into acting for people that don't know? I was a theater student mm -hmm. in high school. I went to Edward R. Murrow. I had like audition for a bunch of different drama theater programs because when I was coming up, when, I, when it was time for me to go to high school, like I always was into music, mm -hmm. but at the time there was no programs to go to to like work on my rap skills or be mm -hmm. a rapper. So my next like best thing to me was film. They kicked me out after my sophomore year though. For what? <laughs> my attendance was just oh. was poor. You know, mm -hmm. I was like one out of three black kids. And the great thing about that is, I was one out of three black kids. It was me and the homie Sadiq, who played Ghostface on Wu-Tang. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it was dope, you know what I'm saying? Connecting to see back us. with him, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? Connecting back with him, the whole full circle joint. Did but, you ever think you would lose your rap identity as Joey Badass playing Inspector Deck? Um, no, nah, I didn't think I was going to lose my rap identity, but that is a good question because I was always reluctant about playing roles that were too close to who I am in real life. Mm -hmm. But when I got off of that, you know, it's Wu-Tang. Like, that's a big honor. And then RZA has been one of my mentors in this game for a long time. So I definitely wanted to come through for him. Like, I felt he's come through for me a lot of the times. But, you know, then I got power and then I got on Viv, though, for Wu-Tang. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the Jay-Z connection, because you referenced that a couple of times on the album on Make You Feel. 
And I might be paraphrasing here, but you say peep game like Jay. That's that's why that's he why didn't, didn't sign, sign me. Us. That's why I didn't, he didn't sign us. Keep the game at bay like the 49ers. Jay's like an idol. I read his book, Decoded, and that line was inspired by a piece in Decoded when he said he met with Russell Simmons for the first time. Mm -hmm. And he, he details the experience as him like remembering sitting at that table and looking at them and thinking to himself like, damn, like I don't want to be signing these I want to be these You remember your first conversation with Jay? Your first sit down with him? Yeah. What hell yeah. I was 17 years old. I was in Denver. He flew me back out to New York to meet with him. And, <laughs> you know, I was a funny little nigga. So I walked in and I'm like, yes. Like, nigga, whatever it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a dope experience, man, because at 17 years old, I felt so limitless. It was probably like when I was 15 or 16, like I visualized in my mind, like I want to be signed to Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. So when I was going up in that Rock Nation building like a year or two later, I'm like, damn, I could do anything. Mm -hmm. I'm already in alignment with my idol. Mm -hmm. Anything is possible. Did he tell you why he didn't sign y'all? It's funny, like I always see him now and I be wanting to have that conversation. But the time, I feel like the time never permits like where we at. But I, I be wanting to ask him that. I was so young at the time, and to me, there was no reason to not sign to Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there was other factors involved and shit like that, so I'm not really sure what exactly happened. Because based off the album, it seems like y'all used to be up there a lot, like skateboarding in front of the, the building. Well, uh, yeah, they showed us a lot of love. Okay. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? They show, to this day, you know, he, he looks out for me, shows me a lot of love. So it's just always been... Um, more like three degrees of separation. You know gotcha. what I'm saying? And I, I like what you said about this being a reintroduction to Joey Badass because you do tell so much about yourself. You talk about your uh, cousin Richie Rich writing your, writing your first rap. Yeah. Well, what kind of battery did that put in your back? He just like really gave me structure. You know what I'm saying? Like he taught me how to count balls and all that. And then, you know, I had other older cousins who used to rap and shit like that. For a long time, it was a running joke because... When I was a kid, I used to always tell him, yo, y'all need to bring me to the studio, boom, boom, boom. And then my shit blew up. And I was like, ah, y'all yeah, they bring me to the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember writing your first rap? Nah, nah. But it must have been in like first grade. Because mm -hmm. that's when I was introduced to poetry. And I identified it as like, I was like, oh, this is the shit that Biggie doing. Mm -hmm. That's like what my brain said. You know what I mean? And then from there, I got into poetry, but I would always do like rap style poems. But um. I remember the first time I spit that verse that my cousin wrote for me for my mom's. I was like nine years old. Mm -hmm. When something like, my name is Little J and I got the nine. You mess with me and I blow off your mind. They hating cuz I be on my grind and I always shine. Why you acting like you sell Glocks? Before I put a pipe bomb in your mailbox. Mm -hmm. Some shit like that, right? I'm she nine years old. Right? I don't even know what the she I'm really talking you about up. for real. I, nah, she even snatched me up. She was like, do you know what a nine is? <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, I'm, to me, I'm like, I'm nine, so it just sounded like <laughs> nine. <laughs> nine years old, you feel me? I'm like, nah, she was like, it's a gun. First of all, I was like, word. <laughs> and then she gave me the realest advice. She was like, yo, look, if you want to do this, you could do that. But you just got to be true to yourself. And from there, I just kind of took that and ran with it. She didn't say nothing about the pipe bomb? Nah, she's <laughs> about that. About the I think she kind of figured out that it wasn't my words. Word, you know gotcha. what I'm saying? Somebody else was involved in that. All right, we got more with Joey Badass. When we come back, don't move. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We're still kicking it with Joey Badass. Charlemagne? Now, uh, I love Written in the Stars, too. You mentioned your daughter earlier. You said your daughter was your wake-up call. What did, what did that wake-up call look like to you? Yeah, you know... I felt so obligated in earlier years in my career to take care of people to the point where a lot of the times it burned me out, feeling like guilt, survivor's guilt and mm. things of that nature. But, mm -hmm. you know, when my baby girl came, it was like, oh, OK, this is really the only person I'm responsible for. You know what I'm saying? And now that she's here, it's different. Like, if you can't respect that, then, you know, we can't even be cool no more. How's your life changed? How do you move differently now that you have a girl? Well, yeah, you know, definitely more focus, definitely more intention in everything that I do, especially when it comes to, you know, spending. And, um, you know, I, I say it made me more patient. It made me more gentle. It made me more um, willing to learn and listen. How did it change your overall perspective of women? Definitely, like, you know, from time to time, I would have the thought, like, 
I wouldn't want my daughter to, you know what I'm saying, being in a situation mm-hmm. like that. So it definitely kind of gives you a heightened state of awareness when it comes to that interaction. But, I mean, I've always been a super respectful man anyway. But, mm-hmm. like, you know, with my baby girl in my life, it definitely kind of shakes my mind in a way like, let me try to be more like the version of the man that I would want my baby girl to grow up mm-hmm. and, you know, be with, really? deal with. Do you ever look at it like, I was this way as a man and now I got to change because I don't want my daughter to like that as a man? Yes and no, because, you know, life is about growth. You know, nobody's going to come straight off of the tree like, boom, perfect. That's right. Like, nah, you got experience. And, you know, I, want, I don't want none of that to be hidden from my child. Like, I don't want her to ever view life as a thing where you could skip steps and still get by. You know, we all got we all got all types of childhood traumas that we couldn't even run from if we tried to. That's right. These are the things that affect us and you know what I'm saying, ultimately shape who we are. You know what I mean? But as long as, you know, you got that growth mindset or as long as whoever she's with got that growth mindset, then I got some patience. You know, I got some sympathy. Now in the baddest, first of all, you and you and Diddy seem like y'all have a strong relationship. Absolutely. How you and Diddy get so cool and so close? Man, I met Diddy twenty sixteen coming out the Rihanna Met Gala after party. Mm-hmm. And one note, he was walking out, I was walking in. And he was just like, yo, King, I've been trying to connect with you for years. Like, I was trying to sign you back in the day. And I'm like, this is all news to me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? This is the first time I'm meeting him. I'm like, wow, word, boom, boom, boom. And then that same week, I had rolling out in Miami. And then I ran into him again. And then from there, it was just like, we were just road dogs. You know what I'm saying? Like, he would be going so yo, Joey, I'm being in New York, boom, boom, pull up. And we just kind of developed that relationship like that. And it's like, I'm EP, super- Two Distant Strangers too. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. yeah. of me, you yeah. know what I mean? I got him on that project. I got him involved. I made a phone call. I'm super grateful for that relationship because me, I'm a sponge. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you bring me around to the right rooms and tables. Like, I ain't taking that for granted. I'm connected. I'm networking. I'm, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm using the opportunity fruitfully, you know what I mean? As it should be. So mm-hmm. the fact that he could identify that in me, I'm very appreciative of that. Mm-hmm. You know, he did the intro and the outro. On the outro, he said something to the effect of, um, we got to bring that New York feeling back. Yeah. Are those conversations that y'all have? And do you think that you can actually bring New York back if you live in some place like Miami or L.A.? <laughs> Don't you got to be here? Yeah, I think you got to be here for sure because you got to connect with the pulse of the city. You know, um, what was the question? I don't know. The, qu- the question was, uh, do y'all have those conversations about bringing the feeling back? Oh, Dude. yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Me and Puff, we've spoken about that over the years. Like, you know, I'll play him some songs. He like, yeah, like, this is the vibe. Or, this ain't the vibe. Or you should do this. You should go more here, you know. But that's usually the focus of the conversation, you know what I'm saying? We always trying to stay in that essence. He, he still know, got an ear? 50 said Diddy don't got no ear no more. 50 said Diddy ain't got yeah, no ear no more? Said nah, last that's, a yeah. that's a lie. <laughs> that's a lie. That's a lie, nah. Puff, I feel like he always going to have an mm. ear. Now, um, you can tell that you've really been doing the work on yourself mentally, too. You know what I mean? Like, you, you go to therapy? Uh... I do. Okay. I do go to therapy. Um, I started going to therapy back in 2020. You know, as unfortunate as that pandemic was for a lot of people, you know what I'm saying? Like, I definitely don't want to be insensitive when I say this. But for me, I needed that. Mm-hmm. I didn't know stillness in my adult life. Like, I hit the ground running at 17 years old. I was still a kid. I didn't realize for about five, six years, I didn't stop, you know what I mean? So when I finally got that space in that time, it was like I just went real deep inside, you know what I mean? And I realized things that I needed. I was like, okay, I need that to be, you know what I mean? Like I need to be held accountable for my shortcomings. I need those to be pointed out to me because I'm what you call a self-improvement junkie. Like I'm committed and devoted to being a better version of myself every time I show up. You could see the evolution in all the Breakfast Club interviews. Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. this is our third one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So I pride myself on that. You know, so therapy was definitely an outlet that I saw to bring me closer to a higher self-awareness and just state of being. What introduced you to it? How did you decide to do it? What was that decision like? Well, you know, I've always been open-minded and I started to resonate with that idea that black people, therapy being so taboo to us, What it was is I was introduced to the concept of emotional intelligence. And that kind of blew my mind. That opened so many doors for me because I'm like, wow, like we really wasn't taught this. How important it is to identify your own emotions in relation to the people around you. You know what I'm saying? Like we might just wake up in a bad mood 
and you wearing that mood mm -hmm. and now your household is feeling that mood facts, yeah. and you don't even realize <coughs> you just passed that mood on to your son mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. your son is in school with that mood mm -hmm. and he passing that on to you know what I'm it's saying like energy is, yeah. energy is so contagious and once I kind of like realized that it started to open little pathways in my brain like damn even identifying with frustration as an emotion. Mm -hmm. If you tell a black man, yo, you being emotional, that's like offensive. Right. But people don't realize that, yo, if you angry, if, if we having a conversation and you just screaming because you mad, you're in your emotion. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? People get emotionally hijacked every day, B. That's right. Mm -hmm. Every day, like blinded by emotion, blinded by rage. So I just kind of started on that path for understanding myself more because I grew up, I had like anger issues. And stuff like that. It was hard to me to identify a lot of things that I was feeling. Did you figure out where that anger came from? When, now that I think about it, looking in hindsight, I think a lot of it came from when my parents split. Me not knowing how to process that and then manifesting into something else. Like me trying to find a reason for it elsewhere. Or, you know what I mean? I came to that same realization in therapy. Like I didn't realize how much my parents divorcing had impacted me Word. and how and how angry I was at my pops for that. Word up. That to do something to you, especially mm -hmm. as a black man. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because now you got that separation from your father, and it's like you need your father Word as up. a black man, especially in this world. Did you ever have that conversation with your pops? Because you know, one of the best things that helped me was having a conversation with my pops and realizing that he was going to therapy two and three times a week back in the day. He tried to kill himself back in the day. He mm -hmm. was on ten to twelve different medications. It made me give him more grace because I realized, damn, he was somebody before he was my parent. Right. And you know, he was just doing the best he could with right. what he had. Yeah, you know, I have to, I have great conversations with my dad all of the time. And it's like, I have my own interpretations of it because my understanding and his understanding is definitely different. And it's like a generational difference. Mm -hmm. And I came to kind of grow and accept that because what fulfills me, what I appreciate, what I'm grateful for is that I could hear my old man's wisdom. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. And it's like, it's up to me to interpret that however I see fit mm -hmm. but just being able to hear that like you know i might feel a little bit more spiritually advanced than my dad but i could never be more experienced than him mm -hmm. right? you know yeah, what i'm really. saying and that alone just make me so grateful for any time we connect you know what i'm saying because i feel like it's a meeting of the minds and you can learn from anybody all right we got more with joey badass when we come back don't move it's the breakfast club good morning morning everybody it's dj envy angela yee charlamagne the guy we are the breakfast club we're still kicking it with joey badass charlamagne do you really meditate every day you say that on the album you say you meditate every day nah it's hard to meditate every day like you know that's more of like a manifestation Word. I would like to meditate every day. I, at a point I was, you know, in the pandemic, mm -hmm. for sure. But one thing I try to do is pray every day because I feel like it's a form of, you know, meditation or just a form of um, being able to, like, program your thinking in the right way. You how know were you during the pandemic with, with everything going on? Because you were in New York during the pandemic? I was in Jersey, yeah. You was in Jersey? Mm -hmm. So how were you during that time? Man, I was just to myself, bro. Like, I called it a time of internal retreat. You know, like I was I was doing a lot of things. I was practicing celibacy. I was reading a lot of books, watching a lot of videos. I started cooking. I was making salads. <laughs> like, you know, you I was you just, were cooking and making salads. Well, yeah, facts. I was making salads, B. I learned how to make salmon, all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, my shit was slapping too. Mm -hmm. Or, what did you see about it? Because I always say, you know, the pandemic, like you said earlier, made all of us be still for the first time. A lot of us had to like really be still for the first time and deal with ourselves couldn't run from our traumas or nothing what did you see that made you be like oh nah i gotta go do some work on myself i saw how much i was settling for the short end of the stick like you know i spent a lot of the the like the first half of my career really focused and obliged to taking care of other people and in that i put a lot of people before myself mm -hmm. so in the pandemic it kind of put things in perspective to me it's like damn I got. I did this one for that one, that one for this one, but what the f do I have to show for myself? Mm. And then that was a whole reset because then I came out the pandemic selfish, but in the best way possible because mm -hmm. I've never been that person. This shit is evident too. Like I'm glad you noticed that. You said, "Yo, you look healthy." Like mm -hmm. this is what I look like when I'm focused on myself. Did the pandemic finally give you the opportunity to grieve, Steez, the right way? 
it definitely gave me opportunities, but um, I don't I don't know. Does, does, does grieving is it, is it a complete process? Does it get? I, I don't know if it's a complete process, but I was gonna say when I listen to Survivor's Guild, I feel like you have finally started processing. Yes, you know, uh, yes. his 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 death. This is the first year where I definitely feel a little bit of peace. You know what I mean? And it's, it's ten years later, but just with Steezes, I'm still majorly grieving my cousin Junior death. Junior, you know? yeah, yeah. peace. How are you processing it? Like, you know, did it make you look at, cause I had a friend commit suicide in 2020 and when she did that, it made me look at suicide differently. It definitely brought me to a very dark place. And you know, me, I'm very intuitive. So something inside me told me, cause I remember coming from the funeral when me and CJ was on the way back like to the crib. And I remember telling him like, yo bro, we gotta be strong for everybody else mm -hmm. because it's easy to fall right now. And I got pulled into that shit, even mm -hmm. after saying it, even after having that awareness and that understanding that I couldn't go there, I still got sucked into that. You know what I mean? It, it brought me out a very low low place. I was depressed. Like I felt so many ways. I'm like, damn, like 17 years old. Like I know so many people who's so much older than me and they've never lost somebody this close to them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was just, it was a lot of, unsettling emotions and feelings and at the same time dealing with fame mm -hmm. for the first time dealing with you know what i'm saying like the ills of that it was bug it that's was natural bug. though i'm sure your therapist told you that you gotta allow yourself to feel your feels like yeah all those know, feelings are natural and that's what i realized too like first of all i'm grateful for the fact that i was able to put a lot of my trauma off because i was so busy because mm -hmm. i don't know what i would have did with that idle time mm -hmm. you know what i mean like i was highly depressed like i felt suicidal all of that, you know what I mean? Like I was very convinced that I wasn't gonna live past 25. Like at 17, 18, I was very convinced of that. I'm like, there's no way. Like I didn't see life after 25. Even when I turned 25, that was a mind for me. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm like, damn, I did not visualize life this far. Wow. And then right there, I drew up a 20 year plan. Cause you look at suicide differently. Cause a lot of people, especially in, in New York, it's probably all over the world, but especially in New York when Growing up as a kid, when you think of suicide, the first thing that people think is you're soft or you're weak. Right. But then when you start having those emotions and that feeling, you are, you, you realize it's far from that. First of all, it's weird to say this, but like I think suicide is a incredibly brave thing. It's it like, is. No, it is. You have to have a lot of audacity to do that to yourself. You know what I'm saying? And then it's like to withstand that pain or whichever way, like, you know, like it's heavy, but it's like, there's nothing soft about that. Nothing at all. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember when I was at that point, I'm feeling low and like, as low as I was feeling and as convinced I was that like, I didn't really want to live, I couldn't find that courage to actually do it. My, my homegirl Jazz, rest in peace, she did it in 2020, she completed suicide. That's what they say to say, Shanti Das. But uh, Jazz said she was so intentional and so calculated and so strategic that when she did it, in my mind, I, I processed it like, she just knew it was her time to go. Yeah. Like I, you know, I, I've, I've never had that feeling like it's time for me to exit, you know, mm -hmm. but even if you go look at her Twitter, she was saying things like, I wonder what my next life is going to be like and things like that. So something came over her where she knew today is my day. Yeah, nah, Steve's, it was the same way with Steve's, you know what I'm saying? Like he definitely was vocal about it leading up to it happening. You know what I'm saying? And like when I, it was just, it was weird, man, it's weird. That, uh, did the port, did it, buying that new Porsche 911, did it really help your mental health? That's what you say on that? <laughs> yeah, a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Because sometimes you got to show yourself, like, what you can, like, achieve. Like, it, with, with it being a superficial item and a material thing, to me, it, it more represented me having a goal, mm -hmm. you know, and me proving to myself once again, like, anything is possible. Like, that was my dream car. Mm -hmm. And... I could have got it for a long time, but then one day I just decided, yo, I'm going to do it. And yeah, it really did something for my state of being, my mm -hmm. state of mind. You know what I'm saying? Like, I had to prove to myself, like, I know all I got to do is be connected to the source, but <laughs> nah, I need the Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I love about you, Joey, man, is like, when you, when you see a black man doing the work, it does reflect in his life. It reflects in the way he looks. It reflect, mm -hmm. reflects in his career professionally. Just probably your best body of work album wise. Word up. You see what you're doing that. in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. that. So that's why, man, when I see when I see that and I hear you telling these stories about going to therapy and everything, I'm like, that's gonna convince so many more black men to go go do the work. Absolutely, man. It's like, you know, I always pride myself on being some type of role model. 
Cause it's like with this position I got, with this stature, with this platform, it's like I got so many people listening. And I feel like the least I could do is implant seeds mm -hmm. that'll sprout, like, you know, more opportunity for these people or just, you know, wisdom that'll transmute into the right directions for these people and stuff like that. And also just making them not feel alone. Mm -hmm. Like I realize that like my most relatable work is my most vulnerable work. And usually when I go there, like a survivor's guilt mm -hmm. or show me, people relate to that more. Mm -hmm. Let's get into a joint off the album. What you want to hear, bro? Uh, let's hear Where I Belong. Mm. Where I Belong. We appreciate you for joining Joey us. Joey Badass, yes, man. Keep it's, growing, my brother. It's yes, Joey sir. Badass. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. This is The Rumor Report with Angela Yee. Rumor has it. On The Breakfast Club. So listen up. Nah, 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 well, Chris Brown went on social media yesterday. He went on his Instagram story and he asked people, do you think I've done enough to get a Hollywood star? So a lot of people responded thinking that he already had one, uh, wondering why he would not have one. And the criteria for a star includes professional achievement, longevity in the category of five years or more, contributions to the community and the guarantee that the celebrity will attend the dedication ceremony if selected. Yeah, absolutely. Chris Brown did so much for this uh, culture. Absolutely, he deserved one. I'm surprised. You know, I didn't know. I didn't know Biggie didn't have one. I didn't know Notorious B.I.G. didn't have one. I, you, I don't. Yeah, I don't know what the criteria is, but it just seems to me like it's something that I guess you get over time. Because I look at people that are getting them, like you know, Mary J. Blige just recently. Ashanti, got one. Khaled just got one. Nipsey Hussle just got and one. And we know recently. Nipsey just got his. Yeah. Yeah, well, okay. it's a process well, to it. You have to you have to submit for it. it. They just don't give it to you. You have to submit for it. Somebody on well, your team or a celebrity or somebody has to put your name, I guess, not not in a hat, but they have to, you know, submit, and then you're nominated for it. With that said, well, Chris it seems Brown like he meets the one. criteria. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But Why I don't get all this real estate to keep putting all these stars down, though, because I haven't walked down that boulevard before. It don't seem like there's that many, that much block. Well, it's, diff <laughs> it's, it's different blocks, stars. different areas. Like some might be in front of this area, some might be in front of that area. But it's you know it's LA, so LA is huge. They should do oh, one in New okay. York. I thought, I thought they, they should always do one in New York too. I thought that would be dope too. Be gum all over it. <laughs> all right, now Trilla <laughs> has responded in to New Swiss Beats. Pigeon, yeah, it'd be pigeon poo. It's all good. Rat poo. Uh, Trilla has responded to Swizz and Timberland's twenty-eight million dollar lawsuit. And so the statement was obtained by TMZ. And according to the statement, Triller saying that both Swizz and Timbaland have already collected over $50 million in cash and stock after selling them their idea. But they're saying that they have to fulfill a versus quota. And that's what is resulting in the dispute. They said this is not a feud over versus, but simply about earnout payments to Swizz and Tim. Swizz and Tim have personally been paid by Triller over $50 million in cash and stock to date. And they stand to benefit even more over time. In addition, they have annual obligations which if met and no breach has occurred entitles them to additional payments only one payment of 10 million dollars is in question we do not believe they have met the thresholds for that payment yet which include but are not limited to delivery of a set number of versus events for 2022 we have been trying to resolve this amicably and this does not affect versus operations or trailers ownership of versus if this does proceed in court we look forward to a judgment that weighs all the facts you know, I saw people yesterday saying, um, this is why, you know, Swiss and Tim, you know, should have kept it to themselves and they should have never went corporate, blah, blah, blah. No, Swiss and Tim built something during COVID and they sold it. I'm not mad at them for getting that money. And I'm not mad at the the artists that they put uh, money in their pockets as well, too. So I think they succeeded, right, if yeah. you ask me. Now, T.I. is responding to Drew from the Chainsmokers saying that he was punched in the face because he kissed T.I. on the cheek. If you all recall, here's what happened. We are on a vibe, and I, and I was like, I gave him a kiss on the cheek. It was totally my, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, don't do that. And I was like, okay. He pushed me off, and I was like, all right, my bad. Dude, his friend goes, you need to get your boy. And I go, what the f I don't even know and, what happened. Goes, I had no context. And he punched me in the face, and I was like, okay, I'm sorry. And he was like, all right, cool, we're good. <laughs> It was the weirdest interaction ever, because, like, I'm sure, like, he... You did the and, coolest thing ever, and then you kissed the eye. <laughs> First of all, T.I. is fully in the right here. I was, oh, like, man, I was, like, right. feeling... I was feeling the vibes way too hard. <laughs> and, I got, and I kissed T.I. on the cheek. <laughs> and he punched me in the face for it. All right, well, here's what T.I. had to say in response to Drew. But I love... I love the chain smoking, man. It made great music. It made great music. 
you know. I think I think the most important thing to 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 take away is is afterwards. We had a drink. We took a shot, and now we, I mean, and we moved on. You know, everybody, you know, left. Like I said, love to change smoke. Not to get no sugar though. You know what I'm saying? Not no, you know, <laughs> to get no sugar. Mm -mm, no, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Still a fan. As a matter of fact, I uh, would love to have you guys on expeditiously. You know what I'm saying? If you can find, if you can find the time for us to <laughs> sit down and chop it up, man. I'd love to kick it with you. If y'all got some time on your hand, man, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's catch a vibe. <laughs> Not to get no sugar though. I love to change smokers. Just not enough to get no sugar though. <laughs> That's why I be trying to tell you. Would it you be every weird morning, to you if, if some guy kissed you on the cheek? You said what? Would it be weird What'd to you? you? Like, would you react if a guy kissed you on the cheek? Somebody kissed Charlemagne and I. On I the haven't cheek. when okay. it happened. No, like a week ago, somebody kissed me and Charlemagne on the cheek. Kevin Gates like always greets you yeah, by Kevin kissing Kevin Gates you on the always cheek. Kiss on, uh, kisses us on the cheek. I, I you know. I got Italian homies that have kissed me on the cheek. I never thought anything of it, to be honest with you. Me neither. But if you're just kicking it at a club and whatever, and then just out of nowhere, not like a greeting. What are you talking about? Like, just, hey, like that? Yeah, don't be kissing me if you don't know me now. <laughs> like, the people I'm talking about actually knew, they know me, so it's different. Yeah, he, you know? Know, like, he knew them, right? They was all hanging out. Oh, yeah, you're right. I don't know. I guess it just depends how you try to do it. It's just different. Like, when somebody gives you, like, when Kevin Gates gives you a dap, he leans in. I mean, I guess I've been knowing him for a while, so I, I expect it, I guess. And he, he does it. I don't think nothing of it. Yeah. Uh, when, one of the Italian homies do it. I don't think nothing of it. But So how, how would you want somebody to kiss you on the cheek then, Charlamagne? I ain't giving you no ideas. And by the way, nobody will ever kiss you on the cheek because they'll get black stuff all over their lips because of that Beijing <laughs> you got in your beard. I don't have Beijing in my beard, sir. Well, just for men, whatever the hell kind of diet is. All right. Get it right. All right. <laughs> that is... You're a rumor report. You know, you're a hater. You know what? Wait, next time I say I'm going to kiss you on your forehead, just because you of know, that. You know that? It is. You just want an excuse to kiss me on my forehead. <laughs> it, is an amazing, it is amazing to me that people wanted Swiss and Tim to, uh, you know, keep doing verses for free. Like, keep it in the culture. That's what they were saying. But, but keep it in the culture to do what? Like, y'all just want to be entertained? For free? Nah, that makes no sense. But not only that, you know, they actually play, they pay the artists now. Like, the yes. artist should be get paid. They put on a show. It's a production. Yes. So people have to get paid. They, those lights, that that venue, the artist performing for over an hour. Like, that's not free. They pay that, and I think that's dope. Yo, they built something on Instagram during COVID and sold it. And, you know, according to Trilla, have walked away with $50 million for something that they were doing on Instagram for, for fun. fun. Yeah. Now artists are getting, are getting paid. Like, like, I don't, you know. People are strange. I don't know what people want from people no more. Well, who are you giving your donkey to? That's next. Uh, four after the hour, uh, Laurel Cinematic Arts and Creative Technologies needs to come to the front of the congregation. we like to have a word with them. All right. And then after that, ask Yee. So if you need relationship advice or any type of advice, you can call Yee right now. 800-585-1051. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. Your mornings will never be the same. When it's time to get with someone special, the best way to do it is with Magnum Large Size Condoms. That gold foil wrapper is a badge of honor and it means you're protected. And you take care of things with comfort. Except no substitutes. Bring the pleasure with the gold standard. Magnum. Large size condoms. There is no question that there are problems in this country between police and community. Yes. You are a donkey. To the latest on that police killing of a black man. Now to new developments in the deadly spa shooting rampage. Um, and yesterday was a really bad day for him, and this is what he did. And so we are in a state of emergency. Okay, white supremacist violence is and always has been the number one threat to our society. But I'm also very proud that my wife is white. My wife is white. The, the Breakfast Club, bitches. All right, Charlene, please tell me, why was I your donkey of the day? Well, donkey of the day for Thursday, August 18th goes to Laurel Cinematic Arts and Creative Technologies. Uh, that is a school that goes from kindergarten to eighth grade in West Hollywood, California, that according to their description, provides children with rigorous and engaging learning experiences that promote individual expression through the cinematic arts and creative technologies. Sounds fun and entertaining, right? But hold up, wait a minute. The Los Angeles Times is reporting that they are getting sued by a black mother named Rashonda Pitts. Drop on the clues bombs for Rashonda Pitts, okay? Rashonda has filed a lawsuit on behalf of her daughter after she discovered her elementary school created a cotton field to get students to identify with the real life experience of African-American slaves. 
black people, let's all collectively sigh. I know, I know. We tired of people playing with us the way they would never think to play with any other community. Uh, in her suit, Rashonda Pitts alleges she dropped off her now 14-year-old daughter when she caught a glimpse at what appeared to be a cotton field in the front of the school. You know what her next three words were. <laughs> Oh, hell no. Okay. Word to Maya from Girlfriends, all right? Golden Brooks. Us Girlfriends fans still out here looking for closure, okay? We hate how that amazing show ended, but let me stick to what we are here for. Rashonda uttered those three words, oh, hell no, and then she did what any black mother would do. She requested to speak to whoever's in charge. In this case, it was the principal, Amy Diaz. The principal, Amy, was unable to speak to Rashonda, but Rashonda did get to speak to the assistant principal, Brian when Ness Newski, I know I'm pronouncing that name all wrong, and this fool tried to explain the rationale behind the project, he said, and this is all according to the LA Times, I quote, the class was reading the autobiography of Frederick Douglass and picking cotton was one of the experiences that he wrote about. Hold on, man, let me take a sip of my water. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, because... I, too, have read the autobiography of Frederick Douglass. In fact, the homie Ebony K. Williams bought me that as a gift once. Drop on the cruise bombs for Ebony K. Williams. And there was a lot of other things Frederick Douglass wrote about, okay? And the main takeaway to me from the book was having a belief in yourself, self-determination, courage, and above all else, educating yourself. Frederick Douglass spoke about how white slaveholders perpetuated slavery by keeping their slaves ignorant. Okay, because you got to think at the time Frederick Douglass wrote this book, many people believed that slavery was a natural state of being. You know, they just thought black people were naturally poor, broke, busted, and disgusted. But Frederick Douglass knew better. And that's why he went so hard to become literate. He believed education was the key to freedom. And all of this helped Frederick Douglass to escape bondage and transcend his circumstances to become one of the nation's most powerful voices. Okay, especially against human bondage. Why you ain't teach them kids that? Huh? Why you didn't teach teach them kids, you know, that being an intellectual is not only their right, but an act of rebellion against the wicked system? No. You want these kids to think that all they're good for is to be a bunch of cotton-picking niggas. You would never remind them of their greatness and their ability to overcome any white supremacist obstacle. Okay? Rashonda Pitch, you have every right to be completely pissed off about the idea that the Laurel School would have your daughter and other children pick cotton as a school exercise to identify with the real life experiences of African American slaves. When I tell you they would never, ever play with Jewish people like this. They would never set up a Nazi concentration camp to, to give people the real life experience of Jewish people during the Holocaust. It would never happen. So why do they feel so comfortable playing with us? Rashonda is suing the Los Angeles Unified School District and Board of Education, claiming her daughter suffered emotional distress. And I believe her because this situation has caused me emotional distress, too. I got gas right now. I've been farting ever since I heard this story. And you know I don't fart in my clothes. You know how difficult it is to do a radio show and in between breaks I have to go in the bathroom just to pull my pants down and fart? <laughs> huh? Huh? Now, the suit claims the LAUSD seemingly acknowledged the project was discriminatory and harmful to the students. Wow, you think? You think? People say all the time, Charlemagne, you make everything about race. No, Charlemagne just acknowledges racism. I would love to not have to talk about race, but how? How am I supposed to stop talking about race in a racist country, okay? Anybody who can hear this story and not say to themselves, yeah, that's effed up, simply either does not have a soul, or guess what? You're probably a racist too. Please let Chelsea Handler give the Laurel Cinematic Arts and Creative Technology School the biggest hee-haw. Hee-haw, hee-haw. That is way too much Dan Mayonnaise. Where my girl Kathy Griffin at? She got Please give this giant jar of mail the biggest hee-haw. <laughs> what about Christopher Rock? Does Christopher Rock want to chime in? Cracker ass cracker! I know you think it's so racist to call someone a cracker ass cracker. It is not in this case. It is descriptive. Anybody else got something to say? Crackers! <laughs> Y'all have a blessed day. My, my name is Leonard McKelvey. Charlemagne the God. Uncle Charla. All right. Well, thank you, Leonard. Mm -hmm. Up next, ask ye. If you need relationship advice or any type of advice, hit ye right now. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. 
Need relationship advice? Need personal advice? Just need real advice. Call up now for Ask Ye. Keep the bread. All right, Dre, what's good? Hey, what's going on, Ye? How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm blessed. Um, I wanted to ask you, would you find, like, if you had a boyfriend, you and your man ended up having a child, would you mm-hmm. be offended if he asked for a DNA test before he signed the birth certificate? Um, would I be offended? Honestly, yes. But would I understand? Yes. So okay, I would say good. I get it, but I would be offended. And it probably would make me feel yeah. like, damn, that's how you look at me. But I understand nah, I mean, not, it. Not, and... necessarily, not necessarily, but would you like look at it as like a, a way to protect himself? Because there's people out there, they don't have kids, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, they, they thought it was real between the two and blah, blah, try to build a family. Then they go their separate ways, but still be in the life, but end up not being the child. You know what I'm saying? Being the father of the child. So it's like, not necessarily yeah. a, uh, look, a security blanket. I but, can... I can completely understand that, and in a way, I kind of feel like that should be something that gets done automatically, but I can also understand as a human being emotionally how that would make me feel, you know? So I'm not saying that you're wrong to do that, but I do think that somebody would take offense to that. Like, then you start thinking, is he doing something? Why does he think I'm doing something? Have I done something? Is there something wrong with that relationship? And it may not be those things, but you definitely will think it and maybe act a little funny. (laughs) <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. No problem. Do what you got to do, though. No doubt. Oh, yeah, most definitely. <laughs> All right. All right, we got more Ask Ye when we come back. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We're still in the middle of Ask Ye. Hello, who's this? This is Peter. Hey, Peter, what's your question for Ask Ye? How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. What's up, Charlemagne? What's up? Peace, King. Yo, bro, like, to be real with y'all, man, y'all have uplifted my life. You Because you guys told me, like, about, like, generational wealth and all of that, mm-hmm. I bought a house with my ex now, and now I'm in this house by myself. I just lost my job. My ex seems like he's moving on. And right now, to be honest with you, the question I have is, With me moving towards greatness, how can I stand firm in it? Because I have to look for a job. I'm single again. I don't know what to do. I'm like really lost. Like, but I know I have a goal as far as my music and my writing and my producing skills. I just need to know like, what do I do? What do I do in a moment? where I just don't know what to do. Right. I think that sometimes we can uh, think so much about things that it causes us to not act because we're so busy uh, thinking about all the problems that we have and things that we need to make happen instead of actually going out and making them happen. And let me ask you this. Are you going to be able to keep this house that you guys bought? And is it only in your name? It's only in my name. Um, because of the Okay, heavy- well, that's a plus. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm, I mean, even though I lost my job last week, unemployment is like, I'm able, I'm going to be able to handle my bills for uh, some months, at least maybe a year. Well, that's a blessing. But the thing, that is a blessing. Because of y'all, because of you and DJ Envy, no offense, Charlemagne, but because of y'all, like, talking about real estate, I worked my way into it. And now I'm just like, I'm stuck. I, I, mm-hmm. I shouldn't, I feel like I should have never, I should have never like gone into buying a house with somebody that I wasn't married to. All right. Well, look, it's in your name. So y'all did not really buy a house together. It's yours. Number one. So it's not anything that has to be split up. Now this is your responsibility. And like you said, you'll be able to take care of it. You just lost your job last week. So you can give yourself a moment and cut yourself some slack. I remember when I was on unemployment, I had been working forever you know since I was a teenager and so I was like okay now I'm gonna take a month or two to figure out what it is that I want to do next in my life and get myself back together fortunately you can afford to do that like you said because you do have um, unemployment taking care of your bills for you 
So give yourself a moment. Like you just lost your job last week. You know, you're out of a relationship. I had a really similar situation. That's the best time to take a risk and be really selfish too, right? When you don't have to worry about somebody else, it's just you. And so now you can say, yeah. okay, now I can just go for that whatever is it is that I wanted to go for, whatever, whatever I was scared of, whatever was holding me back. Now's the time to go for it. The slate is clear. Yo, you know what? I appreciate that because I just bought an iMac book, you know, install logic to it or whatever. And like, I'm doing everything that I can right now in order to, you know, make sure I have a successful life. But it's, mm -hmm. it's hard. And I'm hearing what you're saying, but it's, it's really hard. Like, but I appreciate and Peter, what you're saying to me. Peter, and give give yourself some grace in a moment. You're a human being. You went through a lot of different things simultaneously. So I do feel like, yes, figure it out. Every day, give yourself some actionable things that you can do, whether it's getting back in contact with people that can be beneficial, whether it's you finding some job openings, whether it's you updating your resume. Just every day, make sure you do something. But also give yourself a break. It's okay for you to have a yeah. moment where you got to take care of yourself mentally and not have to feel like, oh my God, I lost my job. I have to be doing this. I'm single now. Now I have this house by myself. No, you have a house in your name and not the other person's name that you don't have to worry about getting someone off the house, paying them out, nothing like that. You have your bills that you know you can handle for now. And now you have a little bit of time to get it together and find out what it is that you need to do. And I also feel like it is hard to go through a breakup and also not be as busy. Right. Because then you spend so much time thinking about it. Maybe you're stalking his social Thanks. media pages. Thanks. What is this person doing? <laughs> give yourself some things to do, even if it's not a paid job. Give yourself some things to do that are important to you so that you're not just sitting I wanted around. To get, you know, maybe I mm -hmm. want I'm sorry. I wanted to get and I'm going to be I, I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to let you finish off because I know how you guys are. But I know how you are. You're patient. <laughs> That's why I can't wait for your radio show. But I, I love Charlemagne and DJ every day. My, they my dude. Love you, King. We'll all be on. So that'd be great. Eight hours like of my, amazingness. Yeah, like, my my thing is, I, yo, like, Charlemagne, I don't mean no harm, Angela. I got to just shoot over, and I appreciate your advice, and I'm going to take that advice. Charlemagne, man. All right, well, check back in. Is there is there any way I can check back in? Yeah, just hit us um, hit us up on the email. I wasn't Breakfast trying to cut you off, Gmail. Angela. I wasn't trying to cut you off. I just wanted to let Charlemagne know that at the end of the day, like, bro, I started listening to y'all in 2015, and I didn't like you. But I will say this. You made me love you. And I'm a black gay man who is not the average black gay man. And you, I know you appreciate the gay community, and I appreciate you for that, man. I love you too, and my I, brother. I, and I... And, and I'm in, and I'm in, um, and I'm in, I'm in therapy again because of you. That's amazing. I'm happy for you. Keep doing the work on yourself, King. Well, yeah, Peter, please check back in. I would love to hear an update in a couple of weeks. All right, that was Ask Yee, 800-585-1051. Now we got rumors on the way. All right, and when we come back, Rick Ross responds to Wingstop labor violations. We'll tell you what he said. I will right, we'll get into that next, so don't move. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. This is the Rumor Report Talk to him. with Angela Yee on The Breakfast Club. Mm. All right. Well, we talked about Rick Ross and some of the violations that he had, labor law violations at five Wingstop locations in Mississippi. And he has addressed taking accountability. Here's what he said. I'm going to take time to address something. When you run in the business, there will be mistakes. But as the biggest boss, you never make the same mistake twice. You see, taking accountability when you're the biggest. And remember this, most successful people don't take stumbling as a setback, but actually a stepping stone to greater things. You heard me? I mean, that's what we said. So the yesterday. Department of Labor... Wage and our division revealed they collected over $100,000 in back wages, liquidated damages, and civil penalties. According to these reports, they were uh, saying that employees had to illegally pay for training, uniform safety training, background checks, and even cash register shortages. 
I mean, that's what we said yesterday. It's business. Like, he got franchises. Things like this going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just magnified because it's Rick Ross. Like, all these franchises we freaking all the time, frequent all the time, you have no idea who owns them. But I guarantee you they'd be having these same kind of problems. But if it was a celebrity, every business problem they had would be, would be magnified like they did with, with Ross's situation. All right. Now, Mary J. Blige was discussing the state of R&B with Diddy. Now, Diddy had posted on social media um, who killed R&B. And then he was live with Mary J. Blige. And here's what Mary had to say. That now that it's in the court, they want to call it popular music when Adele and Justin Timberlake get a hold to it. So now it's popular music. You know what I'm saying? But it's been popular music. We've yeah. been had it, you know? Yeah, no, without a doubt. So now, yeah. like, well, what's happening, I think, is people are afraid to feel things. You know, it's so much de de desensitizing going on, you know? I, that's what that's what I think is happening. Like people are just afraid to feel because they think they think it's gonna kill them. Nah, it's it's, it's just gonna it's just gonna heal you. Mm. That's a fact. You're right, mm -hmm. Mary. With yeah, with take Adele it and Sam Smith, they do R and B, and and it doesn't get called that. They call it pop music. You know, so you're not acknowledging uh the the, the genre of R and B when the reality is hip hop and R and B is pop music because pop is just short for popular. We've been the pop most popular genres. Mm -hmm. All right, now Nene Leakes has gotten a Brazilian butt lift, a BBL. And so she did that plus liposuction. She put out a video announcing the news. And apparently she was not a fan of the traditional BBL. She said they came up with a professional mini BBL. She said, I'm only looking to fix my problem areas. So we called in a professional mini BBL and I love it. So I'm going to take you on this journey with me and Dr. Okoro to fix some of my problem areas and become perfectly you. Come follow me on this journey of liposuction 360 and professional mini BBL. Which Ooh, one did so you get, you get Charlemagne? To see. Did you get a mini Charlemagne or full? I don't need one, bro. This all natural over here, baby. I'm organic, you know what I'm saying? And ever since I, I put my measurements out there, you and that, that little producer of ours named Taylor have been very jealous, okay? I am a natural 41, 36, 43. No disrespect to anybody who gets the BBLs and stuff, but your Uncle Charlotte don't need one, okay? Why don't you talk about your cheek implants, though? I paid for them. They mine. You, you, know, you, you know he got cheek implants, right, E? Yeah, I heard about it. Yep. And then Kevin Hart cheek implants. pointed That's right. it out. Kevin, Kevin Hart did point that out. Your cheeks was never that full. You got a little fill in those cheeks. It's okay, though. Yo, shut up. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, Friday actress Angela Means was upset. She did an interview with Comedy Hype, and she played Felicia in Friday. So, you know, bye, Felicia. Yep. You know that part? Mm -hmm. Well, she doesn't head. understand, yeah, her character in the movie, how she was treated so badly. Here's what she had to say. Why was there so much hate for such an obviously beautiful woman? kind you didn't, you didn't hear her using any profanity why would they be so unkind to um you know a family member no one defend her <laughs> and i've asked this question for 30 years mm. why is it so easy for us to dismiss each other like that even even to this day i'll see people saying you know um bye you dirty bitch you fucked up bitch you dumb bitch no not not one time not even the mother said, hey, it's Felicia. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder what's going on with her. That is a yeah, damn that. lie. That is a damn lie. Her sister came to her defense at the end of the movie because Debo was putting hands on her. And she ran down on Debo and told Debo, all these other people may be scared of you, but I'm not scared of you. That's how Debo and Craig got into the fight to begin with. What's up with people, man? Well, she said she was publicly harassed after playing that role as well. It's a movie. <laughs> and by the way, I wouldn't know her if I saw her in the street. Like, she don't, I'm sure she don't look like a, a, a crackhead in everyday life. The, she was playing a crackhead in the movie. Correct. That's the whole point. She was an annoying crackhead. She was an annoying crackhead who was always begging things, begging for things. That's why Craig would dismiss her like that and be like, bye, Felicia, because she was always begging for stuff. Come on, man. Like, we get, like oh, my God. Whatever. <laughs> we supposed to be fake right, outrage well, about that this. Is... <laughs> like, Y'all gonna be fake yeah, outrage about this? She's just sharing how she felt. She actually, she actually was crying and everything during the interview. It's a movie. She's an actress. It's a movie. She was acting, and once again, Nia Long's character, her sister, did come to her defense at the end of the movie. 
And nobody treated Felicia bad in the movie. She was a crackhead. She, the role was a, that of an annoying crackhead. The whole point was for her to be dismissed throughout the movie. Man, I don't right. my business. These people are crazy. All right. Well, the People's Choice Mix is up next. Get your request in. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. Your mornings will never be the same. Certain people make my life easier by helping me out. And ZipRecruiter makes hiring easier because they do the work for you. How? ZipRecruiter's technology finds great candidates, and then you can invite them to apply. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash breakfast to try it for free. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. Reminding you, two days left to my car show out in Atlantic City. Again, shout out to Lynn and Trey. I see them on the road heading up here now. So if you see them out there, they're, they're bringing 30 to 40 cars up. So if you see them on the highway, you know, move out their way, uh, blow the horn for them, give them some support, and, you know, just pray for them. So make sure they get up here safely. All right? That's this Saturday, Atlantic City. Uh, the weather's going to be beautiful. Celebrity cars from Trader True for uh, Lynn's Garage, 50, Meek, Uzi, uh, Fat Joe, uh, Little Kim, just to name a few, Fabulous. Uh, rides and games for the kids. Kids five and under are free. So uh, get your tickets in. I can't wait to see you guys this Saturday. Yes, and then the following Saturday, get ready for Angela Yee Day. That's going to be at the Barclays in the square out in front of the Barclays. We're going to have amazing performances, getting ready for the West Indian American Day Parade the following week. So make sure y'all come out. We have school supplies we're giving away, including book bags and totes for the kids. We got some free food from Chick-fil-A. We have a live art project from Solidarity Moving, games, activities, prizes, a whole lot of things going on. So make sure y'all come through. It's absolutely free for everybody. So you can go to power1051fm.com to get more information. And you do got to get those tickets in advance, but it is free. All right. Well, Charlamagne, you got a positive note? I do have a positive note, man. But I also want to tell everybody to make sure to tune in to my late night talk show, Hell of a Week. It comes on tonight at 1130, right after The Daily Show. Uh, Issa Rae is our special guest tonight, man. So make sure you join us right after The Daily Show on Comedy Central, 1130 p.m. Hell of a Week, hosted by me. And the positive note is simply this, man. The inner conversation you have with yourself is the most important one. Make sure it's healthy and positive. Breakfast club, bitches! Y'all finished or y'all done?